I've been working on the graph coloring problem, but with specifically uh, from uh, kind of the perspective of reinforcement learning. So trying to learn a heuristic for the graph coloring problem and all of these terms and stuff like that, I will go through in the course of uh, the talk today. So let's see, can I skip? Here we go. So this is kind of a rough plan. So I'll talk a little bit about reinforcement learning. Um, I know that a bunch of people here know a bit about reinforcement learning, but there may be people here that don't know that much about it. So I'll give a quick kind of summary of how it works. Then I'll talk about the graph coloring problem. Again, some people will know it, other people won't know it quite so well. Then I'll talk a bit about my research, that'll probably be the longest part, and then some stuff at the end, and then we'll have some questions. Um, so, you know, if you want to ask questions as we go through, feel free, put your hands up, but there will be an opportunity at the end as well. All right, so reinforcement learning, that's, uh, that's the first thing that I kind of want to talk about. I know I can see a few people in the room that do know about reinforcement learning, it's like the area they do their research in, but for um, everyone who, isn't as familiar with it. Reinforcement learning is kind of one of the subfields of machine learning. Um, the, the three main subfields, I think, are uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Um, and they kind of, uh, the differences I'll, I'll, I'll talk about very, very briefly. So supervised learning generally you have a data set uh, and your data set has labels. So each of these kind of cartoons in the top left, it has a label with it. You uh, train a neural network to be able to uh, identify given a bit of data without a label, what the label should be. So uh, ultimately our neural network here should be able to identify pictures of a mouse or a mouse, picture of a duck, pictures of a duck or a duck, pictures of a rabbit or a rabbit. Uh, unsupervised learning, similar idea, but this time your training data doesn't have labels. So you're not telling the, uh, kind of the neural network what you want it to learn. And what it does, we can use it for various different um, purposes, but one of the things you can use it for is clustering. So here it's made these two groups where it says these things are similar to each other. Um, one group is all of the pictures of characters with shoes on and the other one is the pictures of characters without. So it's come up with a different way of grouping these things that, uh, that is different from uh, what we did had in the supervised learning where we're a bit more prescriptive. And then reinforcement learning, you don't really have data in the same way. Um, you kind of generate your data on the fly. So you go through these tasks um, where at each point, you want to make a decision about what action you want to take. So for example, here we've got the state uh, or the, the kind of, yeah, the current state of a chessboard. And we might say to our reinforcement learning uh, algorithm, what move should we take next? And uh, BG4, I think is a, an eligible move in this state. I don't play chess. Um, so uh, they're the kind of three subfields and what reinforcement learning is. So I'll go into a little bit more detail. So reinforcement learning, is generally speaking applied to what are called sequential decision-making tasks. And here's a bunch of examples, some of these quite famous. Uh, so you've got board games, you've got chess, and Go in the bottom left. You've probably potentially heard of AlphaGo, uh, AlphaZero, MuZero, those algorithms. Um, uh, that the development to be able to beat the best human player at Go was a huge step forward in like 2017. 16, thank you very much. Um, and that kind of like, that made reinforcement learning very, very in vogue area. Um, and it happened to also coincide with when I was choosing my PhD. So uh, that gives you some explanations of how I found myself here. Um, you can also use it for uh, playing computer games. You can use it for controlling robots. Uh, and Reinforcement learning is also used in one part of ChatGPT, which I think many of us will have used and enjoyed using, um, but in a, a slightly different way, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, all right, so how does it actually work? So this is the kind of famous reinforcement learning schematic. You've got an agent that is interacting in an environment. That's kind of the world in which it lives. Um, so for example, it might be the, the environment might be the game of chess. Um, uh, the state is the current uh, board configuration with where the pieces are, all that kind of thing. You've got to obviously encode that in some way. You could give it as an image if you wanted to, but if you wanted it to be slightly less high dimensional, then you could just give it the positions of the pieces. Um, and then given the state, you want it to decide on an action. The action gets submitted to the environment where it is enacted. Um, and you get a reward signal, which tells you whether uh, what you've just done was good or bad. Um, you might not always get a reward. So for example, one way of uh, implementing chess would be you only get a reward, say of one at the end of the game if you win, minus one if you lose, zero if it's a draw. 
that's very hard to learn from because that's what's called sparse rewards. You have to do lots and lots and lots and lots of moves in order to get to any reward. And then trying to understand which moves led to that outcome is very difficult. Um, so sometimes you use what's called a shaped reward function, which maybe introduces some bias, but it allows you to uh, understand more frequently whether you're doing well or not. Okay, so that's kind of reinforcement learning in a bit of a nutshell. Um, I forgot I had that animation. Um, so once you have uh, submitted your action, the state updates and you kind of shift on one time step. So now the new state is your current state and you move on from there. All right. So what is the goal of reinforcement? And the goal is simply to maximize the total reward you receive. So, you, you know, you, the, this agent wants to accumulate lots and lots of positive rewards if, if it can get positive rewards or as few negative rewards as it possibly can. Um, but actually, we uh, don't just add up all the rewards. We usually discount them. The reason for that is to make the maths work in tasks that don't necessarily terminate, might go on forever. Um, and in those situations, you can imagine that an agent might just be like, let's keep on just gathering all these positive rewards, let's keep on raking it in. But you don't really want it to do that. You want it to, um, you want it that you want to make sure the maths works, but also there is kind of an intuitive reason for this. You want it to, to in some sense, prioritize rewards in the near future because there's less uncertainty about those. Because if you prioritize rewards in the distant future, the world could end and you might never get them, for example. Unlikely. All right, so this is what it wants to maximize. Um, and in order to do that, you learn what's called a policy. A policy is just a way of deciding, given a state, what action do I want to take? That's it. OK, now that we're all experts in reinforcement learning, um, we can have a look at the various reinforcement learning algorithms that are out there. This is quite an old graphic, so there are some, some uh, other newer and in some cases better algorithms for some of these. Um, but what I have been using is quite a in quote, simple algorithm, which is DQN, which is the one right in the middle there. Um, it was the same one that was used in that Go algorithm um, and introduced in that paper. All right. So let's move on to the graph coloring problem. So this is a specific context in which I'm implying reinforcement learning. So what is the graph coloring problem? Lots of people will know this. Ooh, spoilers. OK, so um, the goal of the graph coloring problem is to assign colors to vertices such that adjacent vertices have different colors. And you try and use the minimum number of colors possible, so the least number of colors. So here is an example of a coloring of that graph on the left. And if you spend enough time looking at it, you can convince yourself that no two adjacent vertices in the coloring on the right uh, share the same color. And I think, so you can see this uses three colors. Yep, I'm colorblind, so I have to double check. Apologies if I get that wrong. Um, which makes this a strange choice of problem for me to work on. But you know, what is a PhD if not an opportunity to challenge yourself? Um, I think that three is the minimum number of colors you can use for this graph. Uh, in fact, it can't be less than three because all of the vertices have degree three. Um, and that number is called the chromatic number. All right, uh, there are lots of applications of uh, the graph coloring problem. Anything where there are like pairwise constraints. Um, so for example, scheduling tasks, if you don't want two events to happen at the same time because they require one single person with a certain expertise to do both tasks, you can't have them happening at the same time. So you can't do two things at once, at least I can't. Um, designing seating plans, um, for example, if if uh, you are planning your wedding and you have a guest list and one of your very good friends is coming and so is his ex-girlfriend and they don't get along very well, or you don't want to sit on the same table, it's literally a problem my friends had last summer, um, you can use this kind of thing to decide where to seat each person such that the probability of arguments that ruin your wedding is minimized. Um, Register allocation, exam timetabling, and then interestingly, somewhat trivially, I guess, but solving Sudoku can also be uh, done using the graph coloring problem, as shown at the bottom there. Probably not the optimal way to go about solving a Sudoku problem, but maybe if you get stuck, you can try it. 
All right, so my research, it kind of lies in the intersection between uh, work on the graph coloring problem and reinforcement learning. That was me before the pandemic. All right, so how are we going to do this? Uh, first of all, you need to uh, represent the graph coloring problem as a Markov decision process or DQM, which is the algorithm. Apparently, three letter algorithms make you look smart. So I try to put in as many as I possibly can. Um, so here's an example of a graph. It's the same one that we saw before. So first of all, the states. Um, a state is just an assignment of colors to vertices. Um, and so this is a state at some point in the task. Um, we've assigned a few colors to a few vertices. I think that I've done it in such a way that no two adjacent vertices have the same color. Again, tell me if I've got it wrong. Um, OK, and then what, uh, what the A refers to is the set of actions that you can take. Um, so in order to uh, color a graph, in the way that I've set it up, we color it sequentially because you know I'm doing reinforcement learning. It's for sequential decision making tasks. So at each step, we need to choose a vertex and the color um, that we want to assign to that vert vertex. That's a little bit difficult in reinforcement learning um, to choose two actions. One way you could do it is to say, all right, we've got all of these vertices and all of these available colors. So the number of actions is potentially number of vertices times number of colors. But that doesn't work because what if not, you can't use any of the currently used colors? You might have to introduce a new one. So because the action space isn't of fixed size, we need to be a little, a little bit clever about how we do it. Um, so the way that I've done it is similar to uh, a technique that's used in some other graph coloring algorithms, which is that instead of choosing a vertex and a color, just choose a vertex. And then the color is de determined automatically using what we're calling a graph coloring rule. Um, so what you need to do is uh, list the colors that you plan to use beforehand, like an infinite number of colors, just in case. Um, and once you've chosen your vertex, give it the first color that it can take. So this one that I've circled, um, it is adjacent to a yellow vertex and a red vertex. So if we go along our list of colors, it can't be red, but it could be blue. So there we go. S dash is the next state, and that vertex we have chosen has been colored blue. That make sense? Good, OK. Uh, all right, P is the kind of the dynamics of the system. It's called the transition probability function. Um, so it tells you how, once you've got a state in an action, it gives you a probability distribution over next states. That's not very interesting here because it's deterministic. So once you've got your action, the next state is determined for you. There's no, no stochasticity in there. Um, so that isn't very interesting. So that's what I'm going to say about it. I've probably already said too much. Um, the reward function R. So this uh, is a way of uh, determining your reward signal, which is what the agent uses to learn. So uh, given a state and the following state, the way that I've defined my reward function, which I think is a reasonably natural way, is to say it's C of the next state, take away C of the previous state. C is the number of colors used. So uh, in this example, we haven't introduced any more colors. So the value of that is minus one times zero, which is zero. Um, hopefully you can see that if you add up all of these rewards throughout the episode, what you'll end up with is uh, the total number of colors used. And that's kind of what you want. And the reason for the minus one is because in reinforcement learning, you always try to maximize your reward. If you multiply by minus one, maximizing this amount corresponds to minimizing the number of colors. So hopefully, yeah, that's all kind of logical, makes sense, not super clever. Um, hopefully we're, you're all still with me. And finally, gamma is the discount factor. Remember I talked about the, the, uh, the agent wanted to maximize the sum of future discounted rewards. Um, I've actually used a discount factor of one, which means that the future rewards are not discounted. The reason for that is because this task always terminates. Right? After you've chosen all the vertices, they've all got a color and that's it. So we don't find ourselves in this situation of like potentially having infinite rewards into the future um, where we need to do some clever stuff with the maths. Um, we could still have a discount factor, but that would 
encourage the agent to prioritize deferring the introduction of new colors. I don't, I can't see that's desirable behavior. So rather than give it that bias, we chose to set gamma equals one. So the agent could do what it wants and hopefully come up with an optimal strategy without us biasing it in any way. All right, what have we got next? So a quick aside, yes. Sorry, thank you. I was just going to ask, can you get every coloring by coloring it with that strategy? Or are there some that you can't reach by? Or every possible color assignment. Only, like, every time you put a new color, it had to be one that satisfied the not adjacent to the same color. Yes. So can you get to it, like the best coloring? Is it, can you prove uh, it? Or? Yes. I, so um, there may have been two questions there. Yeah. Maybe not essentially my interpretation is there were two questions. So. One question is, can you always, using this colouring rule, get to an optimal colouring? The answer to that is yes, and the proof is, seems quite simple, but it's got a couple of slightly fiddly bits, but it's not super complicated. Very much within the grasp of everybody in this room. Um, the other question I thought you asked is, can you get to every possible colouring? Yeah. I don't think so. Okay. But I'm not sure. No, I don't, I don't think you can. But it's not something that, because we were interested in optimal colorings yeah. as best possible colorings, we didn't think about it. Um, one thing that I did want to say that I forgot to say is that um, if we had, for example, uh, chosen this vertex of color next, you can see it's adjacent to red, a blue, and a yellow. So you go along your list. At that point, we would have to introduce green because it can't be red, it can't be blue, it can't be yellow. So for that next step, you'd get a reward of minus one. You've introduced a new color. All right, um, so graph neural networks, why do we need these? Well, obviously um, this is a task that is on graphs um, and graphs are a bit tricky for neural networks to deal with because generally speaking, yeah, I'm gonna say generally speaking, you need either a flat input to a neural network kind of in the form of a vector or if you're using convolutional neural networks, you can have like a, a matrix or a tensor. Um, but graphs aren't either of those. So it's a bit difficult to, well, you, you just can't use you know, standard neural networks. So there was this development several years ago of introducing graph neural networks and they've kind of been built up and built up and now they're quite kind of sophisticated, but this is kind of how they work. And I'll go through this very, very briefly just to give you a kind of a flavor of how they work. So um, given a graph like we've got on the left, I've labeled or put with every vertex and every edge this F of say V1 and F of E1, et cetera. Those are the features of the vertices and the edges respectively. Um, so you start off with a graph that looks like that. You can also have global features or kind of graph level features, which might be like the number of vertices, the number of edges, something like that. But I haven't used them in my algorithm. So, you know, for simplicity, I've ignored them here. Okay, so kind of step two is you, you come up with uh, what we call encodings of the edges. So for each edge, you concatenate the features of the two vertices at the end and the features of the edge itself. So concatenate those three things, pass them through a small neural network, and then out comes an embedding or an encoding of that edge. Okay, then you pass to step three, um, where with, e with those embeddings, we're gonna come up with a uh, new, I'm not going to call it an embedding, but a, a new representation, a new feature for each vertex. So what you do is you take all the embeddings that are uh, incident at a vertex and you perform some element wise function to come up with this aggregation. Um, so, for example, it might be an element wise sum. No, that's not you sum. Let's use mean. So it might be an element wise mean. So for each of these embeddings of the edges that are incident at that top vertex, you're going to average all of the first elements, and that's going to be the first element of your ag v1. Average all the second elements, that's going to be the second element of your ag v1, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so you do that for each of the vertices, and what this allows you to do is that no matter how many edges are coming into or going out, or depending on how you look at it, the vertex, you always end up with a fixed size vector representation of each vertex. You do lose some information there, you can't avoid it, but you, you retain as much as possible and hopefully the algorithm will learn to retain all the salient features. 
Okay, then once you've got all of your vertex aggregations, um, you concatenate the original features of the vertex with that aggregation and then pipe that through a second small neural network and that gives you the embedding or the encoding of that vertex. So what we've done going through, we've got edge embeddings, we've aggregated those and we've got vertex embeddings. Because this task is uh, about a site, uh, choosing vertices, we go through this whole process and once we've got our vertex embeddings, we're going to pass them through a bigger neural network to try and choose which vertex to select next for coloring. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Yeah. Vertex B1 in the embedding, right? But in the fourth step, you also uh, put the vertex B1, which means you actually repeatedly yeah. put the B1. Yeah. Is that necessary or is that? Good question. Uh, I haven't thought about that. You're right. So there's a question uh, or the point was that um, you're including the features of vertex V1 in the uh, to generate the edge embeddings and then you're including it again later. I would say. In certain contexts, not essential, probably because that information could be passed through. But as I said, there is information loss in the aggregation step. So because we like in the fourth step here, we are coming up with the vertex embeddings. It, you don't lose anything by giving it the vertex feature again. Because if you rely on the information that you need not being lost at step three, like it just feels like you're you're unnecessarily asking the neural network to do work that you could do for it without introducing any sort of bias. So if, if you can if you can do some of the work that neural network would otherwise have to do without biasing it, I think in general it's, it's not a bad idea to do that. Um, but yeah, that was a good question that I haven't considered before. All right, so general process: start with uh, original graph with features, get edge emb embeddings, aggregate the edge embeddings, get vertex embeddings. All right, so how are we going to use that? So first of all, we need to parameterize the state. What I mean by that is the state we've kind of defined as a, an assignment of colors to vertices, but we need to get these features in order to use graph neural networks. So how are we going to construct those features? Well, that's a decision that I've made. Um, and I'm going to do it like uh, this. So one of the interesting things, in my opinion, um, it, that came out of this work is how to parameterize the state in a different way than has been done previously in graph neural networks. Um, so we've got the original graph there with the state, i.e. the assignment of uh, colors to vertices. Um, the numbers that I've got in the current state, the first number is just an identifier for that vertex. So if you go round clockwise, it'll be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and the number, the second number, refers to the color that it has. And that is in the order of the colors that was originally specified. Uh, and I've used minus 1 to indicate no color yet. Um, so the standard representation would be to um, just use the edges that were there in the original graph. Um, if I go back to how graph neural networks mean, uh, how graph neural networks work, um, you can see that you come up with embeddings for each of the edges, but only obviously the edges that are there. And what this allows you to do is to pass information around the network, share information between vertices, but only vertices that are connected to one another directly. Um, in the graph coloring problem, I kind of hypothesized that uh, vertices need to know about all of the other vertices and the colors they have, not just the ones they're directly connected to, because it, like, it is a very hard problem. It's an MP hard problem. And sometimes the color of a vertex depends not only on the vertices to which it's connected, but has some long, longer range dependencies. Um, so for that reason, I thought it might be useful to instead of just using the edges that were there in the original graph to uh, fill in all of the missing edges to make the graph complete and just use the features to indicate whether or not they were present originally or not. So a minus one here has been used to indicate that the edge was there originally and zero means that it wasn't there. Make sense? Any questions about that? B1 
the actual graph. Sorry. Uh, so my the, the, my hypothesis was that the way graph neural networks work is all about sharing information, like passing information around the network. That information can be more efficiently passed if all the edges are there. So like you can imagine if it's a line graph, then in order for this vertex to know information about this vertex, as we pass along there, along there, along there, it's like multiple different steps, and each step is one graph neural network block. It's doing this once. So I didn't mention this before, but graph neural networks, you stack them on top of each other to, to gain these longer range dependencies. But to get arbitrarily long dependencies to be captured, you need to have arbitrarily many graph neural network stacks. I mean, how long is a piece of string once you get to big graphs? Like, why, how, like where do we stop? Um, so that's why I thought that having a complete graph representation would, it would really facilitate that information sharing. So that answers the question. Um, Does this actually require like less memory and less neural network in a sense that's doing this way? Good question. So um, for each graph neural network block, it's more computation heavy because there's more embeddings to find, but all of this is parallelized. So it, you know, in terms of time, it doesn't change that much. Um, but it could potentially, and I haven't done all of these experiments, it could potentially reduce the number of graph neural network blocks that you need, how many you need to stack on top of each other, which would reduce computation time. Um, there will be a balance there, and I haven't done all the experiments to know exactly what that balance is, but I will have some results later on if I hurry up um, to show you that this was a good idea. I had lots of ideas that I'm not going to show you results about that were terrible ideas, but this one did turn out to be good. OK, um, so here's an example of how a state might play out. Oh, sorry, an episode might play out. An episode is the colouring of a single graph. Um, yeah, hopefully with ex the explanation I've given so far, you would be able to figure all this out because I've talked about it all so far, but this hopefully just makes it a bit more explicit. Let's talk about my results because I think I'm running short on time. How much longer should I talk for? OK, I've got I've got another 45 minutes, so uh, strap in. Uh, that was a joke, I don't really have that long. OK, so here, first of all, I'm going to talk about some comparisons to existing algorithms. Uh, these are the algorithms that I compare to random. Uh, so all of these are construction algorithms. What I mean by that is that they use this same idea of just choosing a vertex and then the color gets chosen automatically using that mechanism I described earlier. So random, I mean, you can probably guess what that is. It randomly chooses the next vertex of color, obviously only chooses previously uncolored vertices. Um, largest first, so largest first and smallest last are both based on the degrees of the vertices. So largest first, you just list the vertices in order of descend, descending degree, um, and you choose the vertex with highest degree first, and then you work your way down the list. Um, all of the vertices here have uh, degree three, I think. So um, at this point, Largest first would choose, choose randomly between those three remaining ones. Smallest last kind of does the opposite. It uh, lists the vertices in order of degree, and it uh, looks at the vertex with smallest degree, discards it, and all the edges coming into it. And then it looks at the, the remaining graph and then like discards, iteratively does that until you're left with one versus and that's the one that it chooses. Um, so it kind of does it the other way around, but it does, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tiny bit more sophisticated. Desatur is a good algorithm. In fact, all of these are quite good because they all obviously end up in um, correct uh, colorings. Like they, they all end up with a, 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 good, a correct solution. Um, and going back to your question, um, it is possible or there, there exists for every graph an ordering that will yield an optimal colouring. So if you do random enough times, you are going to get an optimal colouring, um, but you potentially have to do it lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, and lots of times. Ricky? Yeah, seems we're going back to it. What's the difference between a valid solution and an optimal solution? Okay, good question. So if I uh, coloured this bottom right one red, and then colour the other two, you would get an invalid solution because you've got two adjacent vertices that have the same colour. Um, lots of algorithms won't even give you a valid colouring. This one always will because of the colouring rule. An optimal colouring is obviously a valid colouring that uses the minimum number of colours that you can do for that graph. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so uh, yeah, what desatur 
does is that it use it orders the vertices by saturation and saturation is equal to the number of distinct colors used by vertexes neighbors so um, this one up here on the left has saturation two because there are two colors amongst its neighbors red and yellow Likewise, this one has saturation two because there's two colors amongst its neighbors. Uh, and the one on the bottom right has saturation three because it's connected to yellow, red, and blue. So the next the one that we're going to choose is that one in the bottom right. Um, and then we're going to iterate from there. Um, unlike uh, the other ones, where the degree-based ones, where they're static, like the order is fixed from the start, um, with DSETO, you've got to recalculate the, sat the saturations each time. No, so so the saturation own well, you only look look at the saturations of the uncolored vertices, and it's amongst its neighbors. Um, so, like if you color the first one red first, and the other ones haven't been colored, then you've got one, two, three that will have saturation one because there's one color. And then you choose them at random, yeah, yeah. You can, you can make it a little bit more sophisticated by saying among the ties, break ties by maximum degree or something like that. But yeah, the fun, the, the kind of simplest way. You never jump around doing little patches. It always works its way out. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Do any of these algorithms read color vertices? No, okay. no. Um, they all take exactly n steps where n is the number of vertices. You choose, you only choose uncolored vertices. There are other algorithms where you can recolor vertices, but they're a different class of algorithms called, like, what well, you can call them improvement algorithms or local search algorithms. Um, but we did not look at those because they're different from what we did. The final one is uh, this one I've referred to as Giannazzi et al., um, which I hope I'm pronouncing right. Um, that was a paper that was published that did uh, graph coloring with reinforcement learning exactly the same kind of thing as I was trying to do, so sensible to compare to it. All right. So here's some graphs listed on the left-hand column. They're the kind of random names. They all come from somewhere. Don't worry about the names. Um, of different sizes from 25 vertices up to 561 vertices. And uh, all for all of these ones, the um, chromatic number, so the number of colors, used by an optimal coloring is known. That's not the case for graphs in general, especially large ones. Um, if we look down here, like in lots of situations, my algorithm, which is called RELCOL, reinforcement learning coloring, um, can achieve the chromatic number. So you know, here, 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 every single time. Sometimes it often achieves the chromatic number, but not always. But some of these graphs are just hard to color. Um, that's why you know this is quite a varied data set here. But I don't know if you can see the bold very easily, but I put bold where an algorithm strictly outperforms on average um, all of the other algorithms that I've looked at. And there are four in the DSETER column and there are four in my column. So it's kind of showing that the algorithm does, you know, all right compared to existing algorithms, you know, compared to a few here. And already by using this kind of graph coloring rule technique, um, the algorithms are always going to be decent because of, you know, it is possible always to find an optimal solution using this method, even for random. Yeah. The algorithm uh, provide an optimal solution or to provide a solution? It provides a solution. So it always provides a solution with no guarantees of optimality. Um, but that is the case for all graph coloring heuristics, any heuristics for combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, exact methods that always give you an optimal solution. Because there's an NP hard, NP hard problem, once the size of the graph gets above like 50 vertices, those things take so long to run that they become basically worthless. Yeah, the, the numbers you show, uh -huh. are they the numbers by which it misses the chromatic number? Yes, good question. That was explained in the blurb, which I've helpfully got rid of. So yes, this is the number of extra colors on top of the chromatic number um, that are used to color these graphs. So yeah, thank you for that question. That was, I should have mentioned that. All right, so um, 
decent, not world beating, but you know, the point actually, maybe I'll come back to this. I'm just gonna say all this stuff in my conclusion, so I'll come back to it. But re reasonable results there, competitive with the best algorithm that we compared to, you know, of this type. Um, all right, what else we got? So um, I talked at the beginning about the data that you put into uh, machine learning algorithms. I said that reinforcement learning, you don't really have a data set. The, the, that was, there are instances where you can use a data set. So for example, in this work, I have, rather than just generate a graph on the fly at random to use to try and color, I beforehand generated like a thousand graphs of like different topologies with different properties. So try to make the data set quite as varied as possible. I said, okay, these are the graphs that I'm going to use for training. And each, at each episode, I'm gonna select one of these graphs at random. Um, just to kind of make sure that it didn't take forever to run, I used uh, graphs with a maximum size of 50 vertices. Uh, obviously, the larger the graph, the more time it's going to take to color it, and the more time it's going to take for the algorithm to train. So just in the interest of you know, computation time, I limited the graphs to 50 vertices. Um, I think the smallest was 10, I think. Um, all right, so I thought, what is going to happen when I try and apply my algorithm to larger graphs, because we know that out of distribution generalization can be a challenge for you know, any machine learning algorithm or uh, anything that you, that you use neural networks for. So um, that is what we saw here as well. So along the bottom, we've got the number of vertices. All of the graphs that I used here were generated using the same process as my training data set. So you know, in theory, representative other than the size. Um, and so you can see over here for graphs of the same size, as the ones that I trained on, so 25, 50 vertices, 50 is at the upper limit. Um, my algorithm, which is the blue diamond, performs competitively with Desatur, which is, uh, you know, a good, arguably best in class algorithm. Um, certainly on certain graphs it is. Um, and then random, just way worse. But you can see as the size of the graph increases, the performance of my algorithm degrades relative to Desatur and gets actually closer and closer to random, which, you know, it's not a strength, let's say, but uh, you know, it's it's probably what I would have expected to see. Um, but it shows that there's something maybe that ought to be done about that. Um, okay, what other results? So this is, um, I think, what I consider to be the most interesting result that came out of this work. And what remember what we were talking about um, representing the the state as a complete graph rather than just using the edges that exist in the original graph. Um, so this is what happens when you, um, it's a comparison of what happens when you use a com complete graph representation as opposed to what I consider to be like a more standard one. And you can see that um, my version with the complete state representation, which is the blue line, like massively outperforms the alternative, which doesn't use a complete graph representation, which I think is a result that just, it, it's not just applicable to graph coloring, it's potentially, you know, quite interesting for any context in which graph neural networks are, um, are utilized. Like, this is something that I want to do a bit more work on and exploring because uh, certain tasks, yes, you know, like, for example, influence maxim maximization, the influence of a vertex will be, you know, directly dependent on the vertices to which it's connected. But there are other tasks, for example, graph coloring, where there are much longer range dependencies, which perhaps justify this complete state representation, but more work needs to be done by someone, maybe me. To figure out the uh, the exact kind of um, benefits that can that are provided by this this inter this representation. All right, the bit at the end. So we're coming towards the end. It seems. Um, all right. So what conclusions have I been able to draw from this? So reinforced learning can be used to learn a decent heuristic for the graph coloring problem. So that's good. It's kind of like a proof of concept. Um, I didn't point to it before, but my algorithm outperformed the other reinforcement learning based algorithm. So that's good. It's we're kind of moving in the right direction, but I wouldn't, you know, begin to claim that what I've done is, you know, the best you can do. Like there are much smarter people out there than me who can potentially build on this and do much better. Um, not just on the graph coloring problem, but in, on combinatorial optimization problems in general. Um, and then the second conclusion, which I just talked about, is that the complete graph representation does seem to improve performance. So further work. 
Um, knowing what my algorithm does that's different to Dsetter, because I had I did show and I haven't shown it in this presentation, but I did show that it does do different stuff. But how is it making its decisions? Could that be used to inform a new heuristic? I don't know. A bit more work to be done there. Um, we saw that it doesn't generalize that well to larger graphs. Can we do anything about that? And then the complete graph representation, we talked a little bit about that a second ago about you know, the limitations or the, uh, the potential benefits that that could provide. And that's everything I have to say, I think. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening.